It's my pleasure to be here, and I appreciate the uh, offer. Nice to see some colleagues, too, that are in the front row there. Dinesh, that was a nice talk, nice uh, introduction there. You'll hear a little theme on interstitial lung disease in, in this lecture as well. So let's get right to it. Um, what, what I'm going to, well, these are my disclosures. Uh, and uh, we don't have the data that scleroderma has in, in myositis. Um, so I can say pretty much anything I want up here and kind of get away with it, sort of. Uh, so really, essentially, none of the agents that, that I'm going to talk about today uh, are FDA approved uh, for myositis. But this is what I'd like to, to talk about in, in, in this first talk. It's always difficult. You get 30 minutes to, to kind of go through a topic, and that's a challenge. But I'm going to talk about some new things. Uh, it's a bit of a, a mixture here, but I'm going to talk about clinical features in the new myositis classification, but talk about autoantibodies. They're just uh, incredibly important in all of our diseases, very prognostically and clinically important. And then I'm going to kind of sprinkle in treatment options, and I'll be happy to answer any other questions that come up later on uh, outside of the, the, the one half hour that I have for the first talk. So this is kind of like what we many of us grew up on in terms of the classification uh, of myositis. Uh, I don't have to read it for you. Uh, myositis is interesting because right in the classification that we have, we have a juvenile subset uh, in there. And as you well know, <clears throat> dermatomyositis predominates over juvenile polymyositis. But we'll come back to this classification criteria. And these are old diagnostic criteria. Even, even if you're a little younger, you probably know the term Bohan and Peter criteria. And again, I'm not going to read those criteria for you. They're, they're listed right there. It includes basically muscle weakness and then the objective manifestations that we have of myositis, electrical features, biopsy features, and then, of course, the rashes. And the problem with the Bohan and Peter criteria, um, and you're talking about criteria that have been around since 1975, there's no good way to exclude other myopathies. And we're going to come to that concept uh, later on as well. In addition, IBM, inclusion body myositis, was probably misclassified in that early criteria. Now we've got a new kid on the block, amyopathic dermatomyositis. And then each one of those criteria was really not specifically defined. So over the past couple of years, and really this is an, an initiative that began a long time ago, and, I, and I'm just going to summarize this data. Criteria data can be a little boring to go through to see how all this stuff comes up, but that's OK. Um, Somebody has to do that work, and it's very important work. But we have this new uh, combined ULAR and ACR criteria for adult and juvenile idiopathic myopathy. And I just summarized it briefly, and, that, and that's why I didn't go through all of the data here. Your candidate variables are assembled from a published criteria. Data is collected from many different disciplines, not just rheumatologists, okay? We've got dermatologists, neurologists, peds clinics, and, it's, and this is a worldwide multidisciplinary approach. These criteria were derived, and each item was assigned a weighted score. Now, if you were at the ACR this past year, and over the past few years, you know that there's this idea that weighted scores are important. For example, uh, I mean, uh, I remember somebody talking about lupus. If you have nephritis, more, that's more points than having uh, oral ulcers for lupus, right? So there's a weighted approach to these types of criteria. And then finally, you get a total score that corresponds to the probability of having myositis. Now, IIM, as you well know, is idiopathic inflammatory myopathy. I kind of save a few words and some breath by calling it myositis, and that's what we'll do during this talk. You can't read this, and there's a reason. Because it's, I mean, it's, this is important data, but this is the criteria that went into the new classification. And it's published, and I put the publication up there, and if, if you want these slides, you can have them. Um, they're, you know, all, uh, they're able to be shared. And 
the bottom line on these criteria is that there is actually also a web calculator that allows you to basically use these criteria in a weighted, in a graded type form in order to kind of make your final determination. Now, as, as we always say, these classification criteria aren't supposed to be used in the clinic when you see these patients, but a lot of doctors do use them. But the important thing for these criteria, of course, is to unify the conceptual inclusion of patients in clinical trials to kind of get everybody on the same page. So the, the bottom line is, and I thought I'd summarize it as opposed to having, having you go through those different criteria. The bottom line here is if patients without classic dermatomyositis rashes, and I will come to this concept later on, do a biopsy. Secondly, if you have DM patients with a classic rash and no muscle involvement, you can consider a skin biopsy. Third thing is, is these criteria provide a score and a probability for having myositis clinical trial purposes, as I said earlier, and they're already outdated. Isn't that encouraging? Just published within the past couple of years, and they're already outdated, and they're already outdated for one of the things that I said earlier, and that is we get smarter every year when we find out more and more about these autoantibodies. That's just an example of why they might be outdated. So if you look at this slide, <clears throat> these are the cutaneous manifestations of dermatomyositis that we see. Gotrin changes. Here's Gotrin changes. This patient showed up to me and had a history of psoriasis, and she said, well, I'm weak as well. Well, it wasn't psoriasis. It was dermatomyositis. We'll talk about an antibody associated with this patient. Looks like they have vasculitis, doesn't it? This patient has a classic facial rash, no nasolabial sparing. Don't ask me why patients with lupus decide to stop at the bridge of the nose. This is a patient who put his hand down next to his thigh. This is the holster sign. And then down here is the heliotrope. This could be a patient with lupus. And this is a shawl sign. So when somebody with one of these rashes shows up in your office and they're weak, that's not a tough diagnosis, okay? That's dermatomyositis. It may be tough to treat, may be a challenge to treat, but it's not, it shouldn't be a tough diagnosis to make. As I said, there it is, and we're still back on our simple classification scheme. Since we're talking about this, and since I said that I'd kind of sprinkle in some issues related to, to management, sometimes the skin, I mean, I, I mean, how many people here really struggle sometimes with the skin features of dermatomyositis? They can be a challenge, all right? They can be tough to treat, and sometimes that's the most dominant feature that we have to deal with. This is a guy that I was seeing. I actually showed his, uh, he was a guy that had the holster sign. You can see this guy that has pretty classic Gotrin changes of his fingers, and he's got the rash over his back and over the chest, and his, and his, and his scalp drives him crazy. So he's, he's a good example of a patient that really struggles with the skin manifestations of dermatomyositis. And scalp rash. Is, is a particularly troublesome problem in patients with dermato. So this is a lady that I had followed for many years, and it just drove her crazy with the degree of pruritus and, and even pain that she had. This is a lady that actually became suicidal due to her severity of, this, of, the, of the scalp rash. This lady couldn't even wear glasses because it was over the, the, the ear area. So these are the, these are the tough uh, uh, patients that we see with the cutaneous manifestations. So I put this algorithm up here, you know, and this is, you know, there's no, there's no reference on this, you know. Um, as I said before, you know, we, you know we're, uh, we're pretty challenged in, in caring for patients with myositis, but this is a general algorithm, and I believe that I had put something like this in one of the review papers that, that I've written. And I, again, I'm not going to go through everything here. There are common sense measures, and then there are first types of things that we do. For example, if you get away with glucocorticoids, and sometimes you can, that's fine. You know, you get away with it, you taper it, they do fine. But oftentimes these patients, and if you look over here in this lower box, you'll see that you're treating them as aggressively as you're treating the other bad myositis complications or the more serious systemic problems. And I'm not going to read through, but IVIG tends to work very nicely. And what we found was even with using that algorithm that we didn't get 
good responses. So, you know, we kind of fiddle around with other things that we have available to us. As you know, we as rheumatologists have, have, have big borrowed and stolen from, from the oncology colleagues. And this was a patient that I had, and I'm not going to, again, go through this whole case, but she had refractory skin. And just take a look over here. We'll come to this antibody later on. It's called the TIF1 gamma autoantibody. Look at the things that she filled. A lot of them, really most of them, had filled because of her skin. So I had the opportunity to use a Premalast in this patient. And after three months, really, I just saw this patient two weeks ago, and she's been on a Premalast for three plus years. And this is the only drug that has actually controlled her scalp and facial and, and elbow manifestations of her rash. And in fact, that's the only medication that she's taking. So if you look at that, if you look at that array of immunosuppressive agents, there's a lot that she has tried. So this was a case report. We just wrote it up. You know, we um, published this last year, uh, as you can see there. Now, we've got Again, newer kids on the block whenever we talk about some of these other agents that we use, and this is a patient, this is a group of patients that I use to treat tofacitinib, and I have three patients listed here. I've probably treated now six or seven, maybe a little bit more, patients with tofacitinib, Zeljans, to treat their cutaneous manifestations of dermatomyositis. And I believe that this medication works as well, and there are clinical trials going on now using tofacitinib in patients. But if you look at these patients again, you'll see that they, they, they you know, these are, this is not a first-line treatment, you know. We, you know, we have to kind of fiddle the system a little bit in the United States, and I've called a couple of these patients seronegative rheumatoid arthritis because they have a little bit of joint pain along with their dermatomyositis, and if I show that they have, again, failed a multitude of other immunosuppressive agents, then sometimes I can get these other agents approved. So I believe that this is another agent that works for the refractory cutaneous manifestations of dermatomyositis. So I've added another box really down on this algorithm, and that is the use of tofacitinib or a premolas. So that's kind of a, a, a sideline uh, there uh, in terms of treatment that I told you I'd sprinkle into this talk. So now I told you about this classification. And this is the problem in this classification, and that is the term adult polymyositis. Now, I know a lot of people in this room aren't mired in the controversy of, a, of adult polymyositis, but there is a bit of a controversy out there. And the one thing that you have to remember, if you're making a diagnosis of adult polymyositis and you don't have that rash that you can hang on, you better make sure that you're dealing with an immune-mediated process because, as you can see here, there are a lot of mimics of polymyositis, and I'll kind of approach some of that in the second talk that I give later this afternoon. So these are the mimics, and that's the problem that occurs with polymyositis. So for that reason, muscle biopsy is essential in, in really the workup of a patient with polymyositis in order to really verify the fact that you're dealing with an immune-mediated process. You don't really need the muscle biopsy in Dermato. We do it a lot. We do it for, for academic purposes, certainly at the University of Pittsburgh and other institutions. But really, you need to do it for polymyositis to make sure that you know what you're dealing with. It's a good example here. I mean, I can remember earlier in my career, we used, we used to say, okay, you got polymyositis, you slap a rash on top of it, that's dermatomyositis. Well, that's not the case. These are essentially kind of two different diseases. And you can see that when you actually look at the histology of these patients. This is a patient with invasion of a myofiber by lymphocytes. So it's essentially lymphocytic invasion of a non-necrotic fiber. And many times they're CD4 positive T cells and T helper cells. If you look at dermatomyositis, it looks different. Sometimes it looks like a vasculitis. But you get perifascicular atrophy. You can see that the fibers in here, in the middle of the fiber, are not as atrophic as those in the perifascicular area. You get an intense inflammatory infiltrate. Sometimes there's B cells. Sometimes there's complement deposition. But it looks different than polymyositis. And as you well know, over the past five years, there's been an addition to that classification 
that I talked about, the subset classification of myositis, and that's what's called necrotizing myopathy. I'm going to touch on that a little bit. So what we called PM in the past, we now, in many instances, are calling it necrotizing myopathy. And this isn't a typo. This is what, the con this, is what this controversy in the myositis field has been about. Adult polymyositis is shrinking. At least some of us believe that it's shrinking. And, and the reason is partly down here because we've got this new necrotizing myopathy that we have in our, in, in our subset classification. And this is an old uh, article. I mean, look, this is 17 years old. This came out of the neurology literature. And I can remember when this came out, I said, well, I'll dare those neurologists, you know, try to tell us that, you know, this polybiocytis is overdiagnosed. You know, we're the, we're, the, we're the master clinicians and rheumatologists, at least that's what we think we are. And uh, actually, embarrassingly, but with Fred Miller, who many of you know also, we wrote an we uh, editorial uh, and said, you know, well, you know, with it may be overdiagnosed, but the bottom line is that, you know, we feel, still think it's a real entity. And uh, things have changed a bit. And then even in our own literature, a couple years later, Eve Choyanoff, who's from uh, Montreal, said maybe we ought to be looking at these patients differently, and maybe there's more of an overlap. So then I kind of write it like this now. I do think that the true isolated entity of adult polybiocytis is shrinking, and really it's a matter of semantics. And the semantics in many instances is driven by the other things that we have available from a diagnostic perspective these days, and that is autoantibodies. And I'll try to touch on those autoantibodies, but many of the patients that we have today are really essentially overlap with another autoimmune disease. So this is the change that's occurred in this classification. And I want to outline, just go back to the one uh, entity that I talked about. This is a real case. I could, I could have many of these cases, but I put this up here uh, mainly to tell you how things evolve in some of our patients over time. So this was a 67-year-old lady who had some medical problems, and she was started on a Torvastatin. And note the dates. This is what I want to kind of emphasize here. So in July 2004, she was given a torvastatin. Four years later, she starts to have lower extremity muscle weakness, and she goes to uh, her doctor um, and talks to her doctor and makes some adjustments. And actually, it's her, um, uh, her, her daughter who notices, and if you look at the date here as well, five years after a torvastatin, she really starts to have some functional problems here. And then a month later, uh, her daughter goes on the internet and says, yeah, mom, I think you ought to stop that atorvastatin. Um, but she doesn't get any better, and she shows up to her doctor, who's been telling her that she's just getting old, and uh, she kind of agreed with them, but says something's different that's going on. And she shows up in September of 2009, and she's got a CK of 6,400, and he says, well, I think that's a mistake. So he repeats it a few weeks later, and it's 9,000. She gets admitted to the hospital, and she gets a muscle, bi muscle biopsy that shows myonecrosis. No inflammation. It shows myonecrosis. And this isn't her biopsy, but it could be. And if you look at this biopsy, it looks a heck of a lot different than either one of those two biopsies that I showed you earlier. This patient has necrosis, 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 but not much lymphocytic inflammation. There's no inflammation in this biopsy, okay? So this is what's called, and this is what came to be known as the necrotizing myopathy. This patient actually was treated pretty aggressively. Uh, she got prednisone, and I gave her methotrexate, imuran, and only when I added IVIG to this patient with necrotizing myopathy did she get better. And of course, whenever this test became available, and you have this available uh, as well here, when the anti-HMGCR autoantibodies, and you know, the Hopkins group did some great work on this, particularly Andy Mammon, who really did some very elegant work on this particular antibody, uh, along with Lisa Christopher Stein, who uh, de uh, defined the clinical part. These patients are anti-HMGCR autoantibody positive. And, and, and really what Andy has also emphasized is that, and I just was lecturing at the University of Washington in Seattle, and the investigator neurologist out there is suggesting that IVIG may be a first-line therapy for patients with 
um, necrotizing myopathy associated with these autoantibodies. There's another autoantibody out there, and, and this was one that had been present for, for a while. I mean, in fact, we reported data on this anti-signal recognition particle subset years ago. And these patients are, again, are a little different. They have acute onset of severe weakness. They have myalgias. They have a very high CK, much like what I talked about. They also have a necrotizing myopathy, or what we previously thought was a PM, polymyositis phenotype. They don't get much dermato. They don't get much ILD. But they also have a poor response to therapy with a variable prognosis. And they actually look like they have muscular dystrophy. So these anti-SRP patients, again, are another group of necrotizing myopathy patients with a different autoantibody and clinical features of a pretty significant myopathic process. Again, this is the pathology of the anti-SRP antibody subset. These patients, again, necrosis and a lot of necrosis, no inflammation. So you would look at that and say, well, geez, that might be just a toxic myopathy. But when you have the autoantibodies associated with these two types of syndromes, then you can then put it into the category of myositis and the, and the category, again, got a little bit broader with this inclusion of not only necrotizing myopathy, but two autoantibodies seen with necrotizing myopathy. And then, you know, finally, what, what I'll put in here now is another subset that has come up over the years, and that is amyopathic dermatomyositis. Again, as a subset under adult dermatomyositis and perhaps even childhood myositis. So what is amyopathic? Well, there's a couple things you have to realize. We call it clinically amyopathic dermatomyositis, all right? That means that it's a subset of myositis patients who have skin manifestations of DM for six months or longer, and they don't have muscle weakness, okay? They may have slightly, now remember, they may have slightly elevated enzymes. They may have a slightly abnormal EMG or biopsy abnormalities. And when you put this together, you basically have clinically amyopathic, meaning totally amyopathic. That is, all they have is skin or perhaps mild muscle but not weakness. So they don't have weakness, but they may have other manifestations of muscle disease. So it's hypomyopathic, but clinically, they're amyopathic. And then, as we've learned over the past few years, there's another autoantibody associated with this subset of patients, and that is the anti-MDA5. It used to be called anti CADM, clinically amyopathic dermatomyositis, 140. And it's called 140 because it's a band that showed up on immunoprecipitation um, um, testing of, of the, the sera of these patients. And then we started to see this sprinkle over the past 10 years in the literature. It showed up in Japan, showed up in China. And in, this, in, in these demographic subsets, Japan and China and other Asian countries, you had this presentation of a rapidly progressive interstitial lung disease, okay? Sometimes they would have acute problems, as you can see in the China cohort there, and, and it, but it was a similar phenotype for the most part in these Asian populations, and the target autoantigen is MDA5, and what is MDA5? Well, MDA5 is a cytoplasmic protein that senses viral RNA and induces type 1 interferon. So you get this interference signature that's off the wall in these patients. And what does that mean? It means it's involved in innate immune defense against viruses. So when you see these patients present with rapidly progressive ILD, and they've got this, this antibody against this cytoplasmic protein, it sort of implies that there could be a viral trigger or some type of trigger that really senses, is being sensed, and then these patients take off with their interstitial lung disease. What we've also found in these patients with this particular autoantibody is a very prominent cutaneous phenotype, and it looks like vasculitis, like that one picture that I showed you earlier. And Dave Fiorentino, who's at Stanford and others, have done a pretty nice job of informing us that there are cutaneous manifestations of these patients with the MDA5 autoantibody. And these findings include palmar papules, as you can see here, uh, um, 
as well as cutaneous ulcerations, and basically looks like a vasculitis, a vasculopathy. So now we've got lung, and now we've got skin, and I present this second case to you again, and I want to I again emphasize the timing and the date here. And I have many patients that I could put up, but this one was particularly um, interesting, uh, to put it mildly. So this lady, again, uh, has a rash in the summer of 2012, and she actually sees one of the fellows that we trained in a, in a, in a d different city in, the, in uh, Pennsylvania. And then she shows up to that doctor, and she's a little bit worse with polyarthritis, mild muscle weakness, and she's got a rash of dermato. And, and you know, she's got pretty much a, a negative workup. She gets better on low-dose prednisone, and then shows up in my office in May of 2013, at which time her rash is a little bit worse. Um, and mild weakness, really didn't have a whole lot, to be honest with you. And I listened to this patient on pulmonary auscultation, and I heard crackles at her, at, at, at her basis. It's interesting, as I was talking to her husband going back and forth, and, and, and I said, geez, you know, do you, do you have any breathing issues? She goes, no, nah, I'm fine. She says, she says, I usually grade my, my myositis because I have to walk up a few flights of steps, and I'm fine walking up those steps. I work on the third floor, and, you know, it kind of gives me an idea how I'm doing. I said, well, you know, I, I want you to uh, uh, bump your prednisone a little bit because of your rash, but promise me that you'll, you know, follow up with the, with the PFTs and a high-resolution CT scan because she didn't have anything like that, and I actually transmitted that to the to the fellow that 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 we that I actually trained, uh, who was her doctor outside of Pittsburgh, and and she eventually did. If you if you if you see here, um, this is I saw her in May of 2013, and she's doing well, so she actually doesn't even get around to getting her CT scan done until uh, June uh, of that year, and she's got some changes. It's not outrageous, but this is not a normal high-resolution CT scan, obviously. Um, she's got changes, and they're kind of patchy. And, and she's fine whenever she gets this done. And, and then on July 1st, again, remember, I saw this lady in May, totally asymptomatic. Uh, I, I, and then on July 1st, she suddenly gets worsening dyspnea. Um, and I get called by the rheumatology fellow, and he says, you know, her rash is a little bit different. And, and, he, and he took a picture of her hands, the, the best picture they could get, and I said, I, I think I know what this is, and, and this, isn't, this isn't good, and she's, short of, she's really short of breath, and this is her CT scan, okay? And remember, that was her CT scan in July, in June, and remember, when I saw her one month earlier, she had nothing, and she was dead in three days with this presentation. She got transferred to uh, University of Pittsburgh, you know, required mechanical ventilation, and basically she had rapidly progressive interstitial lung disease. And, you know, I didn't put up there, but what I told the fellow uh, when he called me with a case, my former fellow, I said, you know, I'd, I'd give her right now pulsar with solumedra, I'd give her rituximab, and I'd also add in cyclophosphamide. Well, it didn't do any good. And again, um, this patient was found to be MDA5 positive. So this gives you an idea of the severity and the rapidity. And there were many groups, and some groups that said, you know, in the United States, I don't, MDA5 isn't, isn't quite what it is in the Asian literature. And, and I said, I'm not so sure that's true. So one of, a, again, one of the fellows that we were working with, uh, CMAC uh, uh, Magadam Kia, uh, who's still with us at Pitt, we did a, a, a nice little study on looking at the anti-MDA5 autoantibody. And these are patients who are MDA5 negative. And we had a nice little cohort here of MDA5 positive patients. And I don't think you want to be on this survival curve um, with MDA5 positivity. And it was a very significant difference, and we published this a few years ago, uh, showing the, 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 the severity of MDA5 antibody positivity, much like it was seen in the Asian literature. Interesting, that being said, I do have several MDA5 positive patients who are quite stable, you know, with skin manifestations and not a lot of lung disease. But when you find that antibody, you better pay doggone close attention to the potential for a severe decompensation regarding lung disease. One other thing that I mentioned earlier is that it's a vasculopathy. And you can see here, and these are two patients, I put these up because they don't have lung disease. They have minimal lung disease. But this lady showed up, and three months later, um, 
Basically, she necrosed her fingers due to the severity of the skin manifestations. And this is another lady who actually was a, 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 a college volleyball player, a very um, you know, well-recognized volleyball player, and she actually necrosed her digits as well. So there can be different manifestations of these patients that have this particular autoantibody. So I borrowed this slide from uh, some of my European colleagues, and thus far we've talked about uh, necrotizing and amyopathic. And, 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 and there's more to these autoantibodies. I, I don't know, how am I doing on time here? Let's see. Yep. Oh, thank you. Jeez. Okay. So we're, you know, everybody in this group knows about the antisynthetase syndrome, but sometimes there's a little bit more to the antisynthetase syndrome. And I'm not going to list there the, the types of features because you know that um, they can be pretty challenging. And these patients are systemically ill. And many times their cutaneous features actually look as though they have RA. But again, the skin rashes and the myositis may be sinal, uh, 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 subtle, and the real clinical problem here is a lung dominant disease with the antisynthetase syndrome. And I put up this other patient here. Again, she showed up in January of 2001 with an FUO. Two months later, she shows up in my office with worsening myalgias and arthralgias and pleural effusions, and she's got fever. And I say, you know, you got something else going on here besides your FUO. And we actually took serum from her blood 20 years ago, and, and she shows up one month later back then, and she's got dyspnea that's worse with diffuse pulmonary infiltrates, and she ends up having an anti-PL12, which is an autoantibody that's in the antisynthetase group. And in this patient, she, I, I put this up here because, you know, she was pretty sick 20 years ago, and these are her numbers. And if you have those numbers and you're in your 30s, those aren't good numbers to have. But what we did was we gave her a medication called tacrolimus, all right? And that was a medication we had the opportunity to use because we uh, had a well-known hepatic uh, transplant surgeon there, did a lot of liver biopsies, Tom Starzl, and this patient never developed myositis. And over the years, she responded, you can see 2019, these are her numbers. And she responded to tacrolimus, and she has, that is the only immunosuppressive medication that she has ever received. So you know, and I didn't have a chance, we published data, because um, uh, I thought that patients with Joe one which is the most common autoantibody, and then there's these non-JO1, all synthetases. And, and what we found was that there's a different clinical presentation in these patients that have non-JO1 antisynthetase antibody activity. And, and I just summarized this, and we've summarized this in a paper that was published in the Annals. Non-JO1 patients frequently present with non-myositis symptoms. So you better keep your eyes and ears open because these patients may not read the book and go through all of the antisynthetase syndrome manifestations. And the point is that the diagnosis is often delayed. Why is it delayed? It's delayed because these patients don't have the classic combination of symptoms, perhaps leading to worse survival. So the point here that I made and that we put in the Annals of Rheumatic Disease article is that these synthetase positive patients, whether they're Joe one or not, have pulmonary morbidity, and that's what we often struggle with. And we also said, this tacrolimus may actually make sense in patients with interstitial lung disease. So we did a very small study of, of, of 13 synthetase positive patients, and that was published 15 years ago, again with a fellow, and we found that patients on tacrolimus actually not only did the myositis and the lung disease improve, but it, it, it was actually steroid sparing. And, and the point was that tacrolimus is a little bit of a different concept. It's a, ch it's a tough drug to use. Um, but, but we found that it made sense because it targets the T cell. We also found that patients with rituximab actually improve with synthetase positive ILD. And I don't have time to go through this study, so I'll have to just uh, skip through this here. But the point is that this one study that was done, and it was retrospective, the pulmonary function parameters got better, as you can see here. Um, the HRCT parameters got better, as you can see here in this uh, retrospective study from a few years ago. And actually, they looked at the anti jo one levels, and they actually got better as well. So what, what we've got out there now is an emerging body of literature demonstrating that patients 
with synthetase positive ILD respond to B cell depletion. And there's some nice articles that have come up over the past few years showing this improvement with uh, rituximab. And this is the approach, again, this is published. I, I, um, I'm not gonna go through it. But this is like, like Dinesh talked about, ILD kills my patients with, with myositis. And we've gotta jump all over it. And it's a different entity that occurs in, in patients with uh, systemic sclerosis, who oftentimes kind of percolate along and slowly deteriorate, whereas we, in taking care of these patients with myositis, not only have to deal with that, but we have to deal with the acute and the rapid exacerbation uh, associated with RP, or rapidly progress uh, progressive ILD. So, uh, you know, I just want to conclude there again. You know, it's tough to do this in 30 minutes, but we, you know, we've got a lot of uh, uh, collaborators at Pitt now, and I'm, uh, I'm really thankful uh, to be able to work with them. Uh, and uh, I, I did want to put in a bit of a plug for a, a book that we've published on, on the uh, management of myositis. So uh, I can certainly answer any other questions later on during the question and answer period or, or in between. So thanks very much.